Hello, welcome to some video notes. Today we'll be talking about section uh, 3.4 and it will be a few videos covering this topic which goes through all the different types of inheritance patterns or basic inheritance patterns uh, that genetics is going to be built upon. So this first video we'll be getting into the idea of what we mean when we talk about inheritance and some key vocabulary terms which are necessary for uh, you know explaining inheritance patterns when we're talking about specific traits and different versions of alleles. We'll get into uh, dominant and recessive alleles. We'll talk about Punnett squares and how we do diagrams to show the possibility of what happens when different alleles are combined and uh, what probability that the offspring will look a certain way based on those combinations. Uh, and then we'll get into some statistical analysis at the end, uh, talking about chi-squared and how we can use statistics to determine whether or not a population is demonstrating the inheritance pattern that we think applies to that situation. Okay? So you get nothing! You lose! Good day, sir! So genetics actually has a very long history, all the way back, and we had uh, Gregor Mendel, who was a um, basically a, a monk living in a monastery, uh, and he didn't really want to pursue, or he didn't have the ability, sorry, to pursue uh, a full degree in sciences. He didn't really have the money, uh, so his best. Uh, a, job or his best way to become educated uh, was to join a monastery and to basically live and work there but that also allowed him to get access to lots of written books uh, at the time period so that he, he could continue to study in the fields of scientists or science without really having uh, any proper formal education but ultimately he did become the father of genetics and he did this through really meticulous note-taking and uh, att paying attention uh, to details. So he did a series of experiments uh, where he was growing pea plants. And so as a, mon as a monk living in this monastery, he was responsible for helping them to grow their own food so that you, know, you could feed the people that work at that monastery. And particularly, he was responsible for growing pea plants so that you, know, you could have peas for dinner. And he noticed certain traits about these pea plants. He noticed that sometimes you know, there would be yellow coloring or there would be green coloring on the peas. They would have either a smooth shell or a wrinkly shell. They would either be tall or they would be short. They would have purple flowers and they would have white flowers. And so looking at these different combinations of different traits, there are actually seven key traits that he uh, eventually studied. Um, he started to do some experiments and taking uh, parent generations and creating pure generations of what he believed would only create one type of uh, trait. So, for example, he'd make a pea plant generation that was only purple flowers and would always produce only purple flowers. And then he would take another group that would only produce white flowers. And so he had this pure white flower generation and this pure uh, purple flower generation. And then he'd put them together and he would say, okay, let's crossbreed them, you know, using cross pollination of the pollen grains from the different flowers. And let's see what happens. What do we get? Do we get purple or do we get white? And by studying these inheritance patterns, he discovered that of those seven traits that he was looking at, some of them were more dominant over the other ones. So, for example, with the purple and the white flowers example I just gave you, uh, if you mixed purple and white flower pollen together, uh, you would always get purple flower uh, as the offspring. So purple seemed to be dominant over the um, uh, the white flower uh, trait. And so prior, uh, many decades before DNA was even known to exist or, you know, how inheritance was even understood, he had already mapped out a really crucial aspect of the inheritance pattern is the idea that not all alleles are created equal and that there are versions of genetic traits. There are uh, that can be more dominant over others. And he also determined through his experiments that if you're ever going to cross-pollinate or you're going to reproduce 
uh, things, uh, half of that information or half of the material that make up that parent um, will get donated to the offspring and the other half of that offspring must come from the other parent or this ideal that or this idea that <coughs> everything gets a single copy of a chromosome or a single copy of the genes from each parent and so this is a kind of revolutionary way of thinking about inheritance uh, decades before anybody would really appreciate his work and at the time, uh, most people were unaware of what he has discovered. It was actually because of his meticulous note-taking that his notes on his experiments later in his life, uh, I think even after he passed away, I think is when it became very famous, um, did people really start to incorporate his findings into uh, the modern idea of inheritance patterns, and therefore the field of genetics was created. So it just goes to show that, you know, um, even if you uh, don't necessarily have a great chance to do uh, a, a, an education, a formal education in a university, you can still discover amazing things about the world if you just are really good at, you know, taking observations and also be very organized with your notes taking so that people can later understand it. So we really uh, owe uh, uh, the modern version of genetics partly to Mendel's uh, work with these pea plants and the uh, thousands of seeds that he was doing per trial to to make really solid evidence about his results okay so to get into some uh, key definitions of things so that you have uh, a good understanding of what we're talking about when we go through an inheritance patterns so a lot of this builds around the idea of the idea of homologous chromosomes and so you are going to get DNA uh, through sexual reproduction you are going to get a chromosome from your mother and a chromosome from your father and so how those chromosomes interact with each other uh, does a lot for what type of inheritance pattern we're going to see and so uh, some key definitions first off we, we already have centromere but to remind you of this idea that when we inherit uh, chromosomes chromosomes themselves have a, a section that uh, holds them all together and is useful during cellular division that's our centromere right uh, we have specific loci right specific locations for genes that are always the same for members of the same species so here we have um, uh, this gene gene D and it is located in the same position both for the chromosome coming from the mother and the chromosome coming from the father even though they might be different chromosomes and they are different alleles sorry of the same gene uh, they do have the exact same genes in the same positions then when we start to get into different versions of genes, remember back from earlier notes, we call these alleles, right? So even though they code for the same trait, they don't necessarily have the exact same sequence. And so there could be different versions of the same trait. Thinking, for example, about uh, hair color and eye color. There are blue eyes and there are brown eyes. So it still codes for the same trait, but not necessarily the exact same color. And <coughs> sorry, when we're dealing with alleles, uh, we have different versions of them. We have dominant ones as I said which always will get expressed if they are present and they are recessive ones and recessive ones will only get expressed if there are no dominant alleles present so they will always get over dominated by the dominant alleles and so we don't see them um, getting expressed if a dominant allele is present but if there are no dominant alleles around for that particular gene uh, then you will uh, see those um, recessive traits so in uh, genetics, in order to donate the differences between these types of alleles, when we're thinking about a gene, uh, the alleles have to be uh, using the exact same letter, and the dominant version of that letter will, or the capital uh, version of that letter will represent the dominant gene, and the lowercase version of that letter will represent the recessive gene. Uh, and in most cases, it doesn't really matter uh, what letter you use. Most of the time, we'll use letters like A, all right, and A, or we'll use letters like B and B, right? Uh, and the, so the capital letter represents the dominant and the lowercase letter represents the recessive. Now, uh, when we, because we get our alleles, we get these genes from each of our parents, depending on the combination, there are further vocabulary terms you need to be aware of, right? So the combination of alleles is called a genotype for that specific trait. And there are three different types of genotypes that come from a basic dominant recessive inheritance pattern okay 
whatever genotype you have, the physical appearance that you get from that genotype is called your phenotype. So phenotype is like physical, so your physical trait, versus your genotype, which is your, um, you know, the combination of alleles that you actually have. And so there needs to be a clear distinction between genotype and phenotype. Genotypic ratios and phenotypic ratios are not always going to be the same because um, different combinations of genes can still make the same physical traits, uh, as we'll see as we go through some of the examples today. And so the different types of genotypes that exist when dealing with dominant recessive traits. Here we have at the top, uh, a dominant, uh, or where both alleles are dominant, so we call that homozygous, homo meaning the same, right? So homozygous referring to the gene, so both genes are the same, and what are they? They are dominant. So that literally is referring to the idea that both of the genes, uh, both alleles, for, sorry, for this one specific gene are the dominant forms of those alleles. And so we would use two capital letters to represent those, uh, that gene, uh, that genotype, because they're both dominant. There also could be homozygous recessive, and it's the same idea. It's the similar or the same genes, and what are they? They are recessive, right? So homozygous recessive means that both copies of the genes that have been inherited are the recessive type, all right? And it should be noted that homozygous recessive is the only way that a recessive trait can be present, all right? You can actually see the recessive trait because if you have one dominant and one recessive trait, the dominant will be dominant over the recessive, so you will not see the recessive trait. It's not going to be possible to see it. So only homozygous recessive will show you an actual, um, uh, will actually appear uh, as a recessive trait in an organism. All right, there could be uh, two different uh, alleles, a dominant and a recessive. In this sense, we'll use the word hetero, which means opposite, and zygous referring to the genes. So that means that they are opposite of each other. That means we have uh, one of each type. We have a dominant and we have a recessive. However, because dominant is dominant and, uh, and recessive is recessive, uh, heterozygotes will have a dominant phenotype, right? So both homozygous dominant right and heterozygous will have the same phenotype even though their genotypes are not the same their phenotypes will be the same because they're both going to be expressing the dominant trait okay uh there are instances where we're talking about a recessive trait or specifically when we're talking about a recessive disease so a disease that is caused by a recessive allele if someone is heterozygous for a sorry homo yeah heterozygote for a recessive disease we call them a carrier because they will have the recessive disease uh, allele uh, so they'll have the thing that causes the disease but because they have this dominant version of the allele also they will not actually express the disease so they can pass the disease on to their offspring but they don't necessarily have the disease themselves and so we'll look at a series of recessive diseases as we get into some more uh, complex um, inheritance patterns, also things that are linked to the X and Y chromosomes. It gets, it gets very interesting. And then the last thing we're going to talk about uh, is something called codominance. And so this doesn't really apply to all alleles, but there are some, uh, sorry, all genes, but there are some specific traits that will express what is called a codominant pattern. And that means that both versions of the alleles get expressed at the same time, so they are both being dominant, even though they are different from each other. So an example of this goes back to the idea of your hemoglobin. Remember there is the regular hemoglobin and there is sickle cell hemoglobin, right? If you have both normal genes of hemoglobin, you have normal hemoglobin. If you have both sickle cell uh, alleles of the gene, then you have sickle cell anemia. You have all of your red blood cells will be sickle in shape. However, sickle cell is also codominant, and so you can have a situation where you have HBN, which is the normal, and HBS, which is the sickle. And so HBN and HBS being codominant, 
half of your blood will be normal blood, half of your blood will be sickle cell blood, and so you don't really have full sickle cell anemia, but you are also still kind of resistant to malaria, and so actually being co-dominant for uh, this trait actually is, is a benefit if you're living in South uh, East Asia or certain parts of Africa where malaria is very common. Whenever we're dealing with codominance, there are some rules about how you write it. All right, you have to have a capital letter. All right, that capital letter doesn't necessarily have to be anything specific, but normally we like to use it for the trait. So for example, there are uh, flowers that are both white and red, and they get expressed at the same time, creating pink coloring, right? Because white and red mixed together make pink. So we would use a capital C for color, and then we will use a capital W for white and a capital R for red. And so there are reasoning behind the letteration that we use for codominance. So some other traits, for example, you can kind of use any letter you want. You can use A, B, C, D, Z, you know, whatever you think would be easiest for you to remember. However, with things like codominant, we try to have those letters that we pick uh, have to do with the trait and the specific phenotype that they're being represented. Okay, so uh, these are a lot of really important vocabulary words, so I would take a minute just to make sure you understand them, uh, because as we move on, you're going to hear them come up a lot in the next few slides, and so it'll be easier to understand what we're talking about if you have a good uh, handle of these vocabulary terms. So if you remember from earlier sections of the topic, we've been getting into this idea of sexual reproduction and the fact that through meiosis, we're going to separate all of the chromosomes, all right, so that we create a, from a diploid cell, we end up creating genetically unique haploid cells. And then those haploid cells are going to come back together in order to create a zygote or a new diploid organism that is going to express the genes coming from each parent. All right, so uh, through the process of fertilization, uh, the gametes are going to fuse, and so the alleles that are present at each gene locus, the different versions of the genes on each part of the chromosome, um, are going to have an equal chance to be expressed, right? And so the alleles that are combined together, that's where we get your genotype. And so the genes you got from your mother are the versions of the genes, the alleles of those genes you got from your mother, and the versions of the genes or those alleles that you got from your father, when they come together, um, uh, when the male, uh, sorry, when the sperm and egg cells fuse, that's where you get your specific genotype. Now, depending on what type of genotypes you have, either homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, or heterozygous, uh, you get different phenotypes. And so we can uh, determine a lot about the inheritance pattern of a specific gene or different alleles of a specific gene by looking at the ratio for offspring uh, that produce certain phenotypes based on the uh, apparent genotypes they might be getting. And so if we understand what the genotype inheritance pattern might be, and we look at the physical characteristics of the offspring that the parents produce, that can tell us what type of inheritance pattern we are viewing. And that's really the important skill you need to be getting as we move through the rest of topic three, is you have to be able to handle genetic problems. You have to be able to look at the uh, parents and either predict what the ratio for the uh, children's genotype and phenotypes would be, or you can look at the parent or the, look at the children and based on information about the children, understand what the genotypes and phenotypes of the parents parents must have been uh, because we're following specific inheritance patterns based on these dominant and recessive rules. Okay, so because of Mendel's work, uh, he already kind of figured out what he called the law of segregation. And so Mendel's law of segregation is this idea that the alleles or the genes um, must be separated uh, from uh, in the process of forming the gametes, and then they are recombined uh, into the individuals when they go through the process of reproduction. So uh, the idea of that random assortment and that random separation that we talked about with meiosis and meiosis two and meiosis one and meiosis two, yeah, before we even knew meiosis existed, he already figured out that this must be happening in some level. He already determined that the traits of the mother and the traits of the father, uh, one specific set of those, each of those alleles must be getting inherited for each trait uh, based on his research.
So uh, we'll give you an example uh, of uh, some of the experiments that he did. So on a lot of the notes we're going to be going through, we're going to be using uh, his pea plants uh, as in the examples because you can kind of see where he got his ideas from. So looking at this, this first example, we have a yellow uh, seed, a yellow pea crossed with a, another yellow pea, right? And so uh, Mendel didn't know about DNA, didn't know about chromosomes, he didn't know about meiosis, but he still determined all of this stuff, these inheritable factors. Um, through his experiments and so he called them factors and inheritable factors he didn't call them uh, genes but he did recognize that these these inheritable factors had different versions like yellow versus green seeds uh, blue flower or purple flowers versus white flowers and so he recognized there are different versions of them all right so here is an example of what we were talking about so here we've got a yellow seed crossed with a yellow seed right and if we look at its generation the children that are produced from this crossing, uh, if we looked at it in terms of percentages, right, 75% uh, or three out of four of the children produced have yellow seed and uh, one out of the four or 25% produce a green seed. And so he would do this experiment with thousands of seeds, thousands of plants, lots of trials are being done through this experiment, but he kept coming across this same ratio of about a three to one or 75% to a one to 25% uh, a ratio for the offspring that are being produced. And so he got to this idea that the parents must be heterozygous. So now we know from this experiment that the parents must be heterozygous, then the yellow coloring must be a dominant trait, and the green coloring must be a recessive trait. And so if we write this all out um, with our lettering, we would actually see how this works. And so if we say that a capital Y represents the yellow traits, and a lowercase y represents a green, the recessive traits, right? Yellow is dominant over green, so if the parents are both heterozygous, zygotes like this, they would be yellow in color. That would be their phenotype, but their genotype would be heterozygotes, right? So for each ch child that's produced that has a yellow coloring, they would have some combination of either both dominant traits, or they might have a dominant and a recessive, a dominant and a recessive. So they might be homozygous dominant, they might be heterozygotes, but we know that they get the dominant allele because they are yellow in coloring, right? And the, the one that has green in coloring must be, uh, have inherited both of the recessive alleles, all right? So the recessive allele from each parent must have been inherited, and that's why they are green in coloring, not yellow in coloring, because they've inherited only recessive traits, not any of the dominant traits, which would have made them yellow in coloring instead of green. And so, by following this type of logic, we can determine that green coloring only comes from something that is homozygous recessive, and yellow coloring, the dominant trait, only will be expressed during uh, someone that is heterozygous or a pea plant that is homozygous dominant, right? So we could look at another example of following these alleles. So let's say this is a male plant, right? So this is our female plants here. Uh, this is our female symbol. This is the male symbol. Typically when we do a cross, we write the female first and then we write the male second. And then we use an X to represent the fact that they are reproducing with each other, right? They're multiplying. You can think of X as multiplying. And we will call this our F0 or our first generation or our parent generation, our starting generation, right? And so we think about their genotype, right? We know that yellow is going to be dominant and green is going to be recessive. And so uh, in this simplified case, we're going to be using uppercase for dominant and we always use a uh, lowercase for our recessive, right? So we know based on what happened with that, uh, the results we saw in the earlier slide, that each of the parents must be heterozygote. So they are one dominant and one recessive. That means when their gametes separate during meiosis, right? That means each one of their reproductive cells either has the dominant or the recessive allele, right? So both of them were releasing a dominant or a recessive allele. So understanding this concept, we then can build what is called a Punnett square. And so you need to be able to draw a Punnett square correctly. It's an important part of this topic and it's something that comes up on almost every exam. So you do have to understand how to do this. So with the Punnett square, we follow some really basic rules across the top, Right, so we normally draw the male's genotypes, 
Around the sides, we have the female's genotype, and we fill in one allele, where they were doing a monohybrid cross, one allele for each box, okay? So that means that we're looking at, this would be the dominant, this would be the recessive, let me use black, this would be dominant, recessive, dominant, and recessive. And then all you have to do is fill in the boxes. And so this area represents the offspring, the percent chance of the offspring. So that means if we fill this in, there would be 25% of the offspring would be homozygous dominant. 25% here would be heterozygous. Another 25% would be heterozygous. So that means or there'd be 50% for heterozygous. And there would be a small 25% that would be homozygous recessive. So that means here, these three, their phenotypes would be yellow in coloring, and then this one possibility here ends up making the green coloring. And so that's why we see that three to one ratio with our genotypes is because of this inheritance pattern, this dominant and recessive hair pattern, right? So that's what we see here. We fill that in, and that's what we get. Three uh, genotypes that produce a yellow coloring and one genotype that produces a green coloring. Then what we can do to test this uh, theory even further is we can apply it to a second generation. So an F1 is when we take the offspring from this generation, right, or sorry, this generation right here. We take those offspring and we mate them with each other to see what happens uh, in their ratio, right? What, what ratio do they produce? So for example, uh, again, they're a Punnett square. So here are our genotypes, right? So we have our, our F1, sorry, this is our F1, what I'm talking about, I'm getting an F2. This is our F1 here, all right, the generation that's produced. So the genotypes that are produced are uh, homozygous dominant, 50% heterozygous, and uh, homozygous recessive. In terms of the phenotypes though, it's a three to one ratio, right? So phenotypic ratio, we would say is three to one, uh, or three times as many yellows for every uh, green uh, members of a generation, right? So that's our three to one ratio that we would see if we were to cross two homozygous recessive traits through what we call a monohybrid cross. And so monohybrid cross is looking at a single trait. We are just looking at the coloring of the seed. If we were to look at multiple traits at the same time, that would be a dihybrid cross or a trihybrid cross, and those actually get quite complicated. But for now, we're gonna be sticking with just a monohybrid cross. Okay, and if we were ever to take two heterozygotes and cross them together, we will always get this ratio, a three to one phenotypic ratio, if it is following the um, dominant recessive inheritance pattern. If we don't see a three to one ratio, when we know we are crossing two heterozygote individuals, that means there must be some other type of inheritance pattern. And so we'll get into other types that could occur a little bit later in some other notes. Okay, so then just to run through a few more examples to help you get a little bit more used to this idea and to, to practice applying this. Again, using this idea of uh, yellow as dominant and green as recessive. So here we've got an example of a male and female plant that are both green and coloring. So that right away should tell you what their genotypes are, right? Because they're green and coloring, that must mean they must be homozygous recessive because that's the only way that the recessive coloring of green could actually be present, right? If we were to do a pun square, we could write the whole Punnett square out, but obviously if we only have recessive traits, then all of the children are going to have to only have those recessive traits as well. So that means that only homozygous recessive is the genotype that could possibly come out in the F1. That means the phenotype is going to be 100% green, right? So hopefully that example makes some sense, and then we can get into some other ones a little bit later. Ah, so here is a really great example. So we've got a female that's green crossed with a male that is yellow. Now we know that the female must be green or must be homozygous recessive because she's green in coloring. The male, however, becomes a large question. We don't know if he is homozygous, sorry, I'm using Y. Uh, we don't know if he is homozygous dominant or homozygous, or sorry, heterozygous. It could be either one of these would produce a yellow coloring, all right? So in this instance, we can actually determine what this male is. We can figure out what he is by looking at this ratio here, 
all right, we see a one-to-one -one ratio. So 50% are going to be yellow, and 50% of the offspring are going to be green. So now, having this information, we can then work backwards, right? So we know that if they're going to be green, they must be homozygous recessive. We, uh, we know that if this are all recessive alleles, right, coming from the female, that means that the all of the children have to have at least one recessive allele because that recessive allele is the only thing that can, can be given to them from the female. So that means that if they're yellow in coloring, they must be homozygous, uh, must be heterozygous if they are yellow in coloring. So knowing what the children's genotypes must be, we then can work backwards and fill in our Punnett square. So we know here the female, right? is going to be homozygous recessive, and so therefore the male must be heterozygous, all right? Because there's only one dominant trait being expressed, and then the other recessive trait is the reason why we end up with some offspring that are green in coloring instead of being white in coloring. And so by working backwards, we can also determine what the uh, unknown person must be, uh, and that he must be heterozygous instead of homozygous dominant. And so this idea of using um, the children's off the, uh, the ratio of the offspring uh, to determine what the male is, uh, we would call that a test cross, all right? Or this idea of trying to determine uh, what um, uh, the unknown individual might be based looking at the offspring and seeing what the offspring have produced. And here's another really great example. So we've got a male and a female that are both yellow in coloring. However, we don't necessarily know exactly what their genotypes are going to be. However, if we look at the children, we see that all the children are yellow in color. So that means all of the children could be homozygous dominance, they could be heterozygous, and they would still be expressing this yellow coloration, right? So if this is possible, we could then um, look at the genotypes uh, moving backwards through Punnett square, and it could be possible that they are all homozygous dominant, uh, so the female is homozygous dominant, and the male is heterozygous. It also could be that the male is homozygous dominant as well, and we would still get this same result of all of them being yellow in color. Or these two could have been switched. All right, the male and the female could have been the reverse of this, and you would still also get them all uh, as a yellow in coloration. And so sometimes when dealing with dominant traits, uh, it can be difficult to understand through one generation what the actual phenotype is going to be. So here, or sorry, the genotype is going to be. So here they've told you that the female must have been homozygous dominant and the male was heterozygous. But in the real world application of genetics, you don't always know. And so that's where we're gonna see more test crosses being applied in order to understand what some unknown genotype might be when dealing with a dominant trait. So to give you a little bit more information of how test cross might work, let's give you this example here, looking at a red flower versus a white flower. So we have a female red flower, we have a male white flower, and we know that red is going to be dominant and white is going to be recessive. Now, we don't know if the female is homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive, but we do know that the male must be homozygous recessive. Sorry, we don't know if the female is homozygous dominant or heterozygous, but we do know that the, the male must be homozygous recessive because it is a white coloring. And so by mixing the female with a known genotype, so we know that the, the, the male is homozygous recessive, uh, and looking at the offspring ratio, then we can determine if the female is homozygous dominant or heterozygous, right? So we don't, we know there's a dominant there, but we don't know how many dominants, right? So our possible uh, our outcomes, uh, if we look at the phenotypes of uh, the offspring in um, F1, if they're all red in coloring, well, that tells us that if they're all red in coloring, if 100% of the offspring are red, then the female must be homozygous dominant, all right? Because if she is homozygous dominant, right? That means that every individual gets a dominant allele, every individual gets a recessive allele, right? Uh, 
So that means they're 100% heterozygotes, and 100% heterozygotes, all heterozygotes, red being dominant, would be red and coloring, right? So if we see all red being produced in our test cross, that means, or all the dominant traits, is, or all the offspring have the dominant trait, that means that we are looking at a homozygous dominant individual. However, though, we could have some white and some red, or about a 50-50% chance, or a one-to-one -one ratio of white and red. If that occurs, that means we're dealing with a heterozygous individual, because some of the individuals are going to get the uh, dominant allele and be red, and some of the individuals, or half the individuals, would get a recessive allele and end up being white. And so if we've got a 50-50 or a one-to-one -one ratio for the offspring in our tests crossed, that means, oh well, okay, they must be heterozygous because it's the only way that we could get recessive individuals to be produced in our test cross. Okay, so a test cross is used by mating the unknown individual with a homozygous recessive individual because we know the genotype of a homozygous recessive. They must be, um, for the recessive trait to be there, they must be homozygous recessive. And we look at the ratio. It's either 50-50 if the person is heterozygote or they are 100% um, uh, showing the dominant trait if the person that we don't know uh, is homozygous dominance. And that's what a test cross is. Now, using genetics, so there's a lot of other genetic inheritance patterns that we'll be getting into as we do some other um, video notes. But now, just looking at the simple concept of a dominant recessive trait, uh, we should see certain ratios are relatively consistent when looking at a dominant recessive inheritance pattern. For example, with my test cross I just showed you, right, 100% of the offspring showing the dominant trait, that means it must be a homozygous dominant crossed with a homozygous recessive. If it's 50-50, that must be a heterozygous crossed with a homozygous recessive, right? So we are expecting certain ratios to be upheld, and so we can look at a real-world data that is collected on a sample population, and we can look at the offspring that are produced, and we can determine, based on the what uh, ratio we are seeing, whether or not it is following um, the uh, dominant recessive inheritance pattern that we think it should be applied to. And so in order to do this, we use a nice, simple statistical test called a chi-squared analysis. Okay, so we'll give you this example here. We have this orange cat and a calico cat. And so this is a orange coloring, right? All, I know it's slightly different shades of orange, but it's all consistently orange in coloring versus this is what we call a calico cat, which means that it has variation in its color pattern. It's got orange, it's got brown, black coloration, and it's got white coloration, right? And so we have them reproduce. Okay, this is also, by the way, this is a male. All right, uh, we know this because this symbol here, uh, we're looking at a pedigree. We'll get more into pedigrees a little bit later. Squares are used to represent males, where circles are used to represent females. All right, so this is a male orange cat uh, crossed with a female calico cat. And so we look at the offspring. All of the offspring are females because they're all circles, right? And we see this color pattern. We have uh, three that seem to be all orange in coloration, maybe one a little bit darker than the other, but they're all orange in coloration, and another one uh, being the calico, right? It's the kind of mixed color pattern that, that, that matches the mom. So we would see that this is a three to one ratio in terms of this coloration. And so that means we would imagine if this was following our dominant and recessive allele pattern that we've been talking about before, uh, the male, probably was looking at um, a heterozygote, right? So if, let's say that we used A, right? The female, though, if it was, if it was heterozygote, would have to be uh, recessive, right? Because it's a recessive trait, uh, being a calico in nature, right? Well, that doesn't quite work. It kind of works. Here we've got, uh, that must have happened, right? That must have happened. That must have happened. And then we would have that. All right, recessive there. But if we do our Punnett square for this idea, all right, does that actually match our ratio? Should we get a three to one ratio if we are dealing with this inheritance pattern? If we've got a dominant recessive and homozygous recessive like that, right? We should have 50% being heterozygotes, 
sorry, 50% being heterozygotes and 50% being recessive. And so we should actually see a one-to-one -one ratio if it was following this inheritance pattern, uh, not a three-to-one ratio like we're seeing here. So we have to determine, does the three-to-one ratio, is that close enough to the one-to-one -one ratio that it actually statistically is still following the same inheritance pattern, or are they statistically too different from each other to actually be following this inheritance pattern, and therefore it's the wrong inheritance pattern. It has to be something else that's contributing to this change. And so that's where a chi-squared is going to come into play. And so if you're going to do a test like this, uh, looking at uh, genetic information in cats, you would have to look at uh, specific genes. For example, you could have uh, sex, the hair length, the, the coloration, if it's a white coloration, uh, the pattern, um, the big pigment density, whether or not it's an orange in coloration or if it's a dominant white coloring. Uh, and then you look at the phenotypes and the potential genotypes that would produce that uh, feature. So for example, uh, sex is pretty easy. It's, it's one of two uh, phenotypes and one of two genotypes. You're either a male or a female, all right? Uh, hair length, it could be a long versus short, a long being a dominant trait. So they are both homozygous dominant and heterozygous would produce um, long hair and short being recessive. Uh, we would look at completely white versus some patch white coloration. That seems to be dominant to be completely white. So that would be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. <laughs> Uh, the piebald, this idea of um, no white versus some white versus mostly white, so it's kind of like a patchy coloration there. All right, so that could be uh, based on the number of dominant alleles that you have. If you have no dominant alleles, if your homozygous is recessive, you have no white coloring. If you're heterozygote, you have some white coloring because you have one dominant allele. If you are homozygous dominant, you have two dominant alleles, so then you're still, you're mostly white in terms of coloring uh, if you have this patchy kind of white coloring network. Uh, pigment density, right? It could be very, very dense. It could be very, very diffused, right? So the brown, black, orange coloring isn't very, very dense like we saw with the darker coloration in some of those cats. That would be a dominant trait. Or is it more lighter coloration, creamier color, lighter brown coloration? That might be, uh, those would be recessive traits. Uh, and then orange, right? Is it is it really, really orange or a cream? Or is it orange and a black coloration or a cream and gray coloration or a black and gray coloration? And here is an example of one that we'll be getting into in some later notes, which using those X and Y notations, those are sex linked traits. And so they're actually connected to the X chromosome. So we would see a pattern not only showing up um, between dominant recessive traits, but there would be a very specific pattern if we look at males versus females, because males get two, or sorry, males only get one X chromosome, where females will get two X chromosomes. And so we'll get more into sex linked traits in another set of notes. So we can look at all these different features of these cats and we could try to map out um, their genotype inheritance patterns uh, based on the phenotypes of the offspring, you know, in the environment. So uh, what we could do is use the previous slide or some handout data we have from class from these cats and we would make a table and we would fill in that data from the table uh, look at some parental background some genetic information on all of these different traits and we would conduct a frequency table of, of of how common are they, what, what inheritance pattern ratio are we seeing. And then we would take those frequencies and we would have to use them in a chi-squared test. And so if you were, for example, going to be doing an IA on genetics, you would have to collect all of this information on the individuals that you're testing and the offspring that you're, you're looking at to see if they are following the inheritance pattern. Look at the percent of them, uh, which phenotypes are expressing it versus their genotypes. And then we'd have to use a chi-squared to determine, are they actually following that correct inheritance pattern? Or is it some other type of inheritance pattern or maybe even some environmental uh, factor that's affecting how these physical traits are being expressed? So to understand these cat genetics, let's give you kind of a, a practice problem uh, to go through this. And we're going to be looking specifically at just the piebald frequency, oops, sorry, the piebald frequency here. Uh, so we're going to look at one specific gene. We're going to look at all those different genes. And we're going to give you some data. And we're going to think about how does this data fit into something like a chi-squared equation.
And so we have males and we have females, right? Uh, we have a cat, a female that's crossed and she's some white versus a male that is not white at all. And so we think about the genotypes for this cat, uh, white being a dominant allele and not white being a recessive allele. So there are two different genotypes, that could, or three different genotypes uh, that create three different phenotypes. Mostly white would be both dominant traits, both dominant alleles. Some white would be heterozygotes with only one dominant, and no white would be homozygous recessive. And so if we look at these genotypes, we then can conclude that the female must be heterozygote and the male must be homozygous recessive. So if we're going to mate these together and we think about the frequency of uh, when those children uh, are being produced, we fill out our Punnett square and we see that we should have a one-to-one -one ratio. About 50% of the children should be some white in coloration and 50% of the children should be no white in coloration, right? The F1 generation should follow a one-to-one -one ratio, right? So pretty simple. Uh, uh, genetics right up to this point. If it's following a an applied dominant recessive uh, inheritance pattern, uh, a one-to-one -one ratio is expected in the population. So the thing is, is to do a chi-squared equation, you need to have both expected data and your observed data. So you should have the data based on what is expected following the ideal situation, which would be the uh, the inheritance pattern that we just mapped out, a one-to-one -one ratio. And the observed data is what we actually get, you know, when we look at the real offspring presented in the environment. All right, so if we go through and we do our expected, we are expecting that none of the cats should be mostly white because that's not possible based on our, our Punnett square that we just saw, right? And we observe in our environment that none of the cats are mostly white. So, so far, so good. Our expected value for some whites would be of the, <coughs> oh yeah, we're looking at four cats, by the way. So if it's a one-to-one -one, uh, of the four cats, two of them should be some whites, right? And we see in our environment that we actually see that there are three that are some white. So we're not exactly following the exact expected ratio just yet. Looking at some white out of four cats, two of them or half of them should be no white. And we look at our data and we see that there's one cat that is no white, which is not exactly following our expected ratio. So is a, we should be seeing a two to one, sorry, two to two or one to one. Uh, that is our expected, a one to one. You can reduce two to two down to one to one. Uh, but if we look at our observed, it's a three to one. Right? So is three to one close enough to one to one that it still is following this inheritance pattern and it's just variation in the way the genes are being inherited that we just happen to have three cats that are some white instead of two cats that are some white and one cat that is no white versus two cats that are no white. So to make this judgment, we have to do what is called a statistical analysis. We need to see, is there some probability that this fits into that we're still okay to say that this inheritance pattern is correct. All right, so that is where we use this nice equation right here. That is our chi-squared equation. And by the way, chi-squared can also be written as x chi, uh, which is red as chi with a square number uh, two there as well. Uh, the good thing about this is that you don't actually know how to calculate this. You don't ever have to do this on a test. They will not give you um, data and ask you to use this equation from memory in order to find out if the data is significantly different or follows a certain inheritance pattern. However, if you do any type of IA uh, dealing with comparing different patterns or different groups, there's a good chance you're going to have to use a chi-squared, so you do have to understand how it works. And you can be asked questions about the idea of statistics. Why do we use statistics? What's the point of different types of statistics? And so you do need to understand what a chi-squared test is and what does it show. All right, but you don't really have to worry about the mathematics, so don't worry too much about that. So basically what a chi-squared is doing is it's going to compare the statistical data of the expected versus the observed, and it's going to determine are they similar enough to each other that we can be within 95% sure that our data is correct and that they are following the same pattern, or are they more than 95% or are we less than 95% sure or more than 5% uh, different from each other, uh, so then we are following the wrong inheritance pattern and our idea or our hypothesis about this group uh, must not be correct because the way the stats are being presented. So what we would do is we would take 
the observed data and we would subtract it from the expected data and we would square it and then we would divide it by the expected data and we would do that for every single scenario. So for example, for this first scenario, we would have observed, which is three, oops, three minus two, square it, divided by two. And then we would add to that the other scenario, which here is one minus two squared divided by two. And so we would do this for every single possible scenario that is presented in our data. Uh, we also would do one for this, but that just ends up being zero minus zero squared divided by zero. So it doesn't matter because it doesn't have any data. It's not really gonna influence our results. Okay, so then we take all this data, uh, we take all each of these individual equations, uh, these individual sets, so we end up adding them together and that gives us a chi-squared value. And so we can compare that chi-squared value to a statistical value that tells us whether or not it makes any sense. Okay, so here, we have a chi-squared value, we do all the mathematics here, uh, and it gives us a value of one, right? So uh, we also have to think about what are our degrees of freedom. And degrees of freedom in a statistical test are how many versions of it could we have minus one? Because when you pick something, you take that out of the possibility or the flexibility or the degree that your values could shift, right? So if you end up you know, having something be some white, right? Then the other two degrees would be the other two things, which would be two. So you take the number of possible things that could exist and then you subtract it from one or one from it and that's where you get a degree of freedom. So here we have three possible things that could have happened, right? And so three minus one gives us two, right? So our degree of freedom is two, our chi-squared value here is, uh, is one. All right, so now that we know our degree of freedom, we then would look at a table of critical values and a table of critical values is something you're gonna have to find you know, on the internet uh, at a statistical site. These values are always exactly the same. They are mapped out by really complicated math that even I don't quite understand where these critical values come from, but they are well-established mathematical principles that we base our comparisons on. So with the degree of freedom of two, right? So we've got degree of freedom of two. Our critical value is 5.99, right? So our 5%, 95% sure, 5% that we're not sure, right? We have a 5.99 as our value. So if we think about this, the chi-squared value is less than the critical value, right? Our chi-squared value equals one, our critical value equals 5.99, and so therefore we can support our hypothesis, all right? So even though three to one is not exactly a one to one ratio, it's close enough to our initial idea, all right? It's close enough statistically, our, our observed, our, our close enough to the expected uh, statistically enough that we could say, okay, it's fine, all right? Because that value is less than 5.99, they are statistically uh, similar enough that we can accept this idea that it is following this uh, inheritance pattern, even though the observed data doesn't exactly fit the pattern we expected. Now, you are gonna have to eventually use statistical tests when you get into your IAs, because any good IA, you should do some type of statistical analysis of your data in order to show that your results are statistically significant. And you should not be using the word significant in your reports unless you've done an actual stats test, right? Significance in science really means something. You can't use that word unless you've done a statistical test that has shown significance, right? There are different types of statistical tests. We're gonna learn about them in different parts of units. Uh, and depending on what your IA experiment is, we can help guide you to what the appropriate statistical test is that you should be using. But regardless of what other type of experiment you're doing, there's a very high probability that you're gonna to have to use a statistical test. So the whole point of a statistical test is to uh, validate your conclusions based on your data, right? Um, if you want to show that your hypothesis is true, you wanted to show that you know the 40 degrees temperature produced the fastest enzymatic rate or the concentration of enzyme that you use produced the fastest uh, reaction, uh, you're gonna have a bunch of different data sets that you're gonna compare. And you wanna show through statistics that 
that one that which had the fastest rate is actually the one that had the fastest rate. It's not randomness in the data, it's the actual experimental design that caused that rate to be so fast. So you're gonna have to use a large amount of data. Typically you have to have at least five sets of data or five trials uh, or pieces of data to do any statistical test. So uh, when we talk about doing stats tests, we, you need at least five things. If you remember, we have talked about the five by five rule. You need to have five variants, right, of uh, different versions in your independent variable, and you need to have five trials for each one of those variants so that you have enough data so that you can also do a statistical, sorry, a statistical test. So we think about statistics, all right, if we have a very, very uh, large population, right? So earlier in our degrees of freedom, uh, we had uh, three possibilities, but our sample size was very, very small. We only had four cats that we collected from our environment. Four cats does not actually make a really good statistical test. And so really we shouldn't have been doing a statistical test with only four cats. That's not enough data, right? The more data that we have, the greater the sample size, the more definite we can be sure, or the more uh, significance that can be calculated uh, with our, our specific groups. Here, looking at uh, a group of N, uh, where N represents the population size, an N of 20 versus an N of 40. And so we have a much uh, more narrow uh, statistical probability when looking at a larger sample size. So when you want to do your experimental designs with your IAs, it's best that you can collect as much data as possible for each one of those individual groups so that statistically you can be very, very sure that your results are actually sound and do support your hypothesis uh, doing some type of statistical test. So if you're still unsure about chi-squared and its application to genetics, here are some additional resources uh, you can use. Um, if you go to the PPTs, you can click on this link, and there's some extra practice that can go along with this concept. Now, one of the reasons why we use statistical tests like chi-squared and uh, t-tests and things like that is because as we study inheritance patterns, we want to be very sure that we know exactly what that inheritance pattern for those traits are because ultimately studying genetics is great, but really the application of genetics that's most beneficial to us is studying the inheritance patterns of diseases. And so if we understand the inheritance patterns of disease, we can better educate individuals about what's the probability that they will maybe have a certain disease as they get older, or they will pass a certain trait that might be cause a disease onto their offspring. And so what we're talking about this idea of looking at genetic counseling. How can we advise people about um, you know, procreation and their decision to have a child if there is possibly a high probability that they might pass on a genetic disease, for example, a recessive disease that they don't necessarily know they have and are carriers for uh, to their offspring. So uh, give you an example there, 3,358 genes with a phenotype causing mutation, right? And so it's estimated a total of 20,000 to 25,000 genes that are expressed as proteins, right? So going from 2015, uh, or sorry, uh, these are taking from papers. So, uh, so based on all this idea that these, these 3,000 some genes that cause some type of mutation uh, versus 20 to 25,000 genes that can be expressed as a protein, uh, it's really, really difficult to say exactly if somebody will or will not have a genetic disease. And even though there are lots and lots of genes that are being used to express proteins, and 3,000 some of them uh, might be phenotypes that are be caused uh, some type of mutation that could lead to a disease, uh, genetic diseases actually are fairly rare in the human population. We normally see genetic diseases as one in a thousand or one in five thousand. There's some that are one in fifty thousand, one in a hundred thousand, one in a million, right? And given the Earth's population, those ratios are actually quite low compared to some other forms of disease. So genetic diseases um, do exist in the human genome across the entire earth, but the spreading of these diseases is actually relatively low because normally with a genetic disease, except for some of the examples that have been well studied, for example, sickle cell anemia, we'll get into citric fibrosis in a minute, um, uh, hemophilia, 
a lot of genetic diseases are not just controlled by a single gene, but by multiple genes. And so uh, the inheritance patterns of all of those genes have to be considered when determining the probability that those parents, which might have those genes, will actually pass them on to the children in some type of combination that would result in an actual disease, right? So giving you an example here, something, another disease that we'll get to later in another series of notes is called PKU or phenylketonuria. And this is a very rare metabolic disorder uh, which causes a degeneration of the nervous system. And so as somebody gets older, their intellectual ability uh, decreases because their nervous system, particularly in their brain and spinal cord, starts to degrade. It affects about one out of 15,000 babies that are born uh, in in the world actually have PKU. So uh, it's a disease that we are constantly testing for. It uh, is a permanent genetic disease. There's not very much that can be done to help the individual. They will have the disease. We can help them with the symptoms a little bit, but it's difficult. Uh, they will have a difficult life and unfortunately will have a shorter life because of the nature of the disease. So one of the things that we will test for uh, when doing genetic counseling is to look and see whether or not the parents have the genetic markers. Do they have the potential alleles that could lead to their child actually being born with PKU? If they do have those potential alleles, we can produce a probability, a percentage of whether or not their child would be born with the disease. And then the parents then need to make a decision. Do we want to risk that? Do we want to have a child together? Uh, risking that there might be a 30% or 19% chance that that child would be born with a very debilitating disease. So one of the ways that uh, genetic counseling can be done is looking at inheritance patterns over multiple generations. And so in order to do that, they will have to know the family history and whether or not that specific trait, that disease has existed in that family in the past so that they can try to determine what your um, genotypic inheritance pattern might be based on parents, grandparents, and then leading off into the future what the children might have. And so this would create what we call a pedigree chart. Right? And so this would be mapping the inheritance pattern of a disease through family history, looking at uh, possible genotypes of those individuals. Obviously, if they are alive, we could do some genetic counseling and determine what their genotypes might be. But if they've already passed, we might have to use some guesswork to determine what their genotype was to figure out what some of the other offspring's genotypes would be based on what the parents had in the first place. So. Pedigrees typically follow very specific rules for how they are displayed. Uh, females, uh, we use circles. Uh, males, we use squares. Lines that are connecting a female and a male like this shows that they are married and they've reproduced. And then lines that extend from that point downwards are showing the offspring. Uh, we map the generations on the side. So this is the first generation, second generation, third generation using Roman numerals. Uh, and if someone is not affected by a disease, we normally leave their circle open, right? Uh, it will be unfilled in. If they are affected by a disease, we would fill in um, completely or shade in completely that circle or square. Uh, and if they are uh, deceased, normally they will put like a slash or an X through that individual, knowing that we, we can't necessarily do a genetic test of that individual. And uh, it's not shown here, but there also could be instances if they are a carrier. If they are a carrier, uh, they might have a single dot in the middle, so not completely shaded, or they might be half shaded, right, like that, to show that they have at least half of their genotype is the uh, uh, recessive uh, version of the allele which would cause the disease. So looking at something like this, we might start to wonder, uh, is PKU, so here we're looking at a chart, for example, of PKU, is this a dominant or is the recessive uh, disease and how could we know? Okay, so we can do some quick genetic testing looking at our PKU. So we could think, okay, if this was, we could always start with the dominant and if it's not dominant, we can move on to the recessive, right? So if this person doesn't have the disease, we would say that they are homozygous recessive. If this person does have the disease, we could say homozygous dominant or it would be uh, heterozygous, right, that would produce those uh, traits for that individual, right? If these two people interacted with each other and they mated, well, 
uh, that wouldn't make sense because that means that all of these children would have to be heterozygotes if it was this one, right? So that doesn't make any sense. It can't be that because all of the children would have the disease if it was a heterozygote. So he's not homozygous dominant, but he could be heterozygous recessive. And if that's this case, right, it could be uh, this could have been that, that child's uh, genotype. And then these two other children could be homozygous uh, recessive. Okay, so, so far so good, but now let's look at the other example and see if that's possible. Well, if this individual, uh, this would have to be homozygous recessive, and this person would have to be homozygous dominant or heterozygous. Obviously, it would have to be heterozygous, right? Because it could be ending up like that, right? Where the individual is homozygous recessive from each trait. So it could work out that it is a dominant trait versus a recessive trait. We could also look at this in terms of recessiveness and see if it follows a recessive pattern. Okay, so if this was a recessive disease, all right, uh, sorry, let me use black. This is a recessive disease, all right? Those would have to be both recessive, right? If this individual is homozygous rec uh, recessive like that, all right, that means that, that could be possible and that could be possible. This person could be uh, that or could be homozygous dominant. And in either case, right, that could be possible for the individual who is A and B. So being hominid, homozygous dominant, or homozygous recessive seems like it could be quite difficult. So looking at this, though, we'd have to assume that it is going to be recessive. And we would think that this is going to be a recessive trait. Because if we look at an unaffected mother in generation one has produced an infected individual in generation two, so the mother must be a carrier. So in this instance, we're talking about PKU. All right, the mother in generation one that is unaffected here must be a carrier, so she must be heterozygote, where this person being homozygous recessive, that's how we end up with someone that is homozygous recessive here, or homozygous, uh, yeah, and then other uh, children being homozygous recessive, why they do not express the trait. And so looking at pedigrees, it can be quite difficult to determine the inheritance patterns. We need a little bit more information to try to figure out what uh, would actually happen uh, with this family tree. And so when we look at pedigrees, we're going to get some more practice and some other uh, PPTs as well. Uh, you have to try to map out. It's almost like solving a puzzle, trying to map out this inheritance pattern based on what you see. So once we take all this information in, we would have to look at a genetic counseling. And so genetic counselors, basically, their job is to take in genetic information, take in pedigrees, family history. Um, they have certain computers that help them with calculating a certain probability of risk. And they would then try to give someone some advice about whether or not they should or should not be reproducing with each other based on um, the probability that their child might have uh, a certain disease. And so for an example, uh, we're going to do a little practice looking at uh, citric fibrosis. And so citric fibrosis is a disease that affects your ability to breathe. It causes the mucus that is in the inner lining of your lungs to be excessively thick. And as a result, that ends up uh, clogging your lungs, uh, making it very difficult for gas exchange uh, and makes it very difficult to breathe. And for your entire life, you're going to have to be using uh, special medicine inhalers to help dissolve this mucus so that you can even uh, breathe properly at, at any points during the day. So based on the information uh, in the next slide, we're going to look at whether or not uh, a couple should be considering um, having a child based on the probability of uh, passing on citric fibrosis to their child. Citric fibrosis, or CF, basically results in a mutation of the CFTR gene, which is responsible for secreting this mucus also helps with sweat and digestive juices from the pancreas as well. And so basically, this is a, um, a mutation that completely shuts down um, the, uh, um, the transporter protein that is necessary for creating this mucus and sweat and digestive juices and helping to release them. So it's a nonsense mutation, a, completely, a mutation that completely shuts down a functioning protein. So this results in them becoming extremely thick. All right, and so instead of it acting like a nice lubricant, 
uh, in your um, your breathing tubes and helping you to clean out bacteria and dust. The super thick mucus ends up building up in your lungs, creating a lot of problems, a lot of deep lung infection, uh, and it can limit someone's life expectancy. And typically between 35 to 50 years is what someone with CF <coughs> might live to. And so it's such a serious disease that uh, after a baby is born, we, um, uh, we very, very quickly do a, uh, a diagnosis test where we do a little cut here on the heel of the baby, right? And then we just take some blood sampling and we do some tests uh, with the, the baby's sample uh, to see whether or not they are potentially having citric fibrosis as they develop and get older. So let's look at some information about citric fibrosis to determine whether or not uh, two carriers of a recessive allele should, you know, go on to reproduce if there's a chance that their kid could have citric fibrosis, right? So they are both carriers. So citric fibrosis is transmitted by a recessive allele. All right, so that means that being carriers, they are heterozygotes. So they do not have citric fibrosis, but they do have the recessive allele that could cause citric fibrosis if it was not in the presence of a dominant allele, right? So normal functioning lungs, that's dominant T, and mutated citric fibrosis lungs is the recessive T. So we go through the process of filling on our Punnett square, and we see our three to one ratio with our phenotypes, right? Genotypes, we have dominant, homozygous dominant, two heterozygous recessive, but there could be also be a homozygous, I'm sorry, homozygous dominant, two heterozygous, and one homozygous recessive. So the ones that are homozygous dominant and heterozygous, they will be normal because of the dominant gene being present. However, for the homozygous recessive, there is a chance that they, they, they would have citric fibrosis. So there's about a 25% chance that the child uh, that they produce has citric fibrosis. Now taking that information into consideration, the couple has to decide, is that a low enough odd? Is 75% versus 25% a good enough odd for having a child? Uh, or should they not risk it and consider adoption or some other means of reproduction rather than, uh, you know, chancing their genes uh, producing a child that has a very difficult disease. Okay, so then we can also look at a pedigree chart and help that to inform us about an overall family's history dealing with the disease and whether or not that they should continue to reproduce as well. So here we're looking at multiple generations. We're still dealing with a recessive disease. So you could say this is a citric fibrosis pedigree, right? And so we have individuals that are uh, affected by the disease and individuals that are not, and we therefore also must have some individuals that are that could be carriers as well. And so it wants you to deduce the genotypes and the reasoning you're giving for those genotypes for uh, individuals A and B, individuals C and D. All right, so you can pause the video if you want to give this a shot. Okay. So for A and B, obviously, A and B do not have the disease because they're not filled in, but they have produced individuals that do have, the, sorry, not that one, but just this individual here that does have the disease. So that means that they must be heterozygotes, right? Because they don't express the disease, but they have produced a child that does express the disease. That also tells us for C, right? They are filled in, so they must have the disease. So if their parents are heterozygotes, that means, and they have a recessive, and the disease is a recessive trait, that means he must be homozygous recessive because he does express the disease itself, right? And for individual D, they do not express the disease, right? So they could be either capital T's homozygous dominant, or they could be heterozygotes. So we need to look at his family history with the person that they have married, we see that this is person that has the disease, so they must be homozygous recessive, all right? So if the individual, D, was homozygous dominant, that means 100% of the children would be heterozygotes. So that means that this could not happen if individual D was homozygous dominant. So that means they must be homozygous, or sorry, heterozygous. So if they are heterozygous, like that, crossed with individual uh, that is homozygous recessive. You can get some individuals that are heterozygous, which would be these two. But, and then you could also still get an individual that is homozygous recessive and would still express the disease, like we see there in H. And so person D must be heterozygous, 
because of those reasons. The fact that H has the disease, but generation or individuals F and G do not have the disease. Okay, so this has been an extremely long video. Sorry, but when we get into genetic works, typically it does actually get a, a relatively long because of all the explanation we have to do with each of the practice problems. But if you have any questions, please let me know.